Welcome back to Watches Tonight on Watchbox Studios. I'm Tim Masso, and we have got a full slate this evening. I want to thank all of you first who woke up early or stayed up late to see us from time zones far flung. Remember, before every show, someone pays for these pixels. So be certain to visit thewatchbox.com, the best place to buy, trade, or sell luxury watches on the web. What are we looking at tonight? Well, we have a combination of bad watch listings, Aquanaut versus Nautilus, my choice. We have Why Your Panerai is Broken, the Hublot that I would wear if they gave it to me for free, and my favorite colored gold watches, the sequel to our original. So tonight, let's jump out and just remember that the Watchbox does not just pay for these pixels, I'm going to buy you a watch. An Oris Arctic's Audi GM with Oris Field Compass. It's a $2,500 value, dual time mechanical, stainless steel, swimmable with 100 meter water resistance. There is a link in the description box. You can enter to win right there. Okay. The return of time to run. Run far, run fast from these bad watch listings. Okay. Our friend Herminio H offers us twice the laughs this evening with two infamous offerings from online junkyards. First, Never underestimate the sweet deals you can find on the hitherto unknown Rolex Hulk in yellow gold. Can we go full screen with this one, guys? <laughs> oh boy. Okay, first thing. Uh, uh, this is not just any $100 solid gold Rolex. Uh, this is one that uh, apparently is a previous award in the 24 Hours of Daytona, as this timepiece originally awarded to a winner of the 24-hour Enduro held every year at Daytona. Now, that said, he reminds us that Facebook offers far more than conspiracy theories, Russian GRU bots, and stalkers. And you can see right here a $160 Rolex Yacht Master. That's quite a deal. I have to say, after collecting on this bargain, you can pair it with other quality wares on Facebook Marketplace, like this free couch. So what if the dog had puppies on it? It's free. Bring your own truck. All right. Now, all of the above are obvious and therefore innocuous, but the next listing leaves me a bit worried. So. History has bequeathed many Movado chronographs worthy of your interest and worthy of impressive transaction prices. This is not one of those. This one, which you'll find on eBay, is said to be a Movado 1950 Model 81 Quartz, and this listing is, according to an identical listing, this watch is worth less than 200 bucks in mint condition. So, either we're looking at a vehicle for hardcore money laundering, or I might have found and, no, well, not that one. I might have found an early client for my new K through six math tutor enterprise, judging by that thirty-two thousand five hundred dollar price. Kids, decimals still matter. All right. Help me name and shame the worst listings of the web. Improve e-commerce ecosystem by sending your time to run candidates to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. By the way, that Portuguese tourbillon preview of a feature to come, not a fake. Okay, Horace M. asks, Tim, I have been through a nightmare with my Panerai Luminor PAM311. Guys, let me fill you in. GMT, multi-day power reserve, mono pusher chronograph, very complicated, in-house caliber 2004. Horace continues, I dropped it from elbow height at my kitchen counter, the crystal popped off, and the watch stopped. Now I am being quoted a four-figure factory repair bill. How is this possible? I was told that these were supposedly used by the Italian Navy. It fell all of four feet onto wood. Okay, Horace, and viewers, I chose this question because I've seen some form of it numerous times through my years with Watch You Want and then Watchbox. There is a disparity between ads and reality at every watch original equipment manufacturer, but nowhere does that gap cause more confusion than at Panerai. Okay, and remember, that's Panerai's image, not mine. For a period from the 1930s to around the late 1950s, early instruments built by Panerai, Officine Panerai, watches included, were used by Italian Navy commandos, initially of the Decima Flotilla during World War II, early amphibious warfare types. And these guys were actually the fascist true believers, so 
Politics aside, this is the image that Panerai sells. Here's the problem. After that point, Panerai's watch activity slowed dramatically and the company turned to industrial products, everything from aircraft landing gear to signaling equipment, until 1993 at which point a few enterprising executives within the company decided to sell Panerai-built replicas of the military originals. Vendome Group, a predecessor to today's Richemont and then a division inside the tobacco-driven Rothmans empire, bought Panerai, just the watchmaking activities, in 1997. Which brings us to today. Today's Swiss-based brand, Officine Panerai, sells luxury watches and luxury watches with a capital L. If you're looking at something like a solid gold PAM 277 complication, trust me, you're not a frogman flopping in the mud. And you need to remember that they are no more durable or more vulnerable than timepieces from other major luxury brands. But Panerai has an insistence on using images of World War II commandos that continues to cloud this fact for those who are new to the brand. Rest assured, they may be in the image of yesterday's combat watch, but a Panerai watch is a luxury timepiece. It's just as susceptible to shattering, breaking, and stopping if it free falls four feet onto wood. You have been warned. All right, okay. So right here, uh, I can see Culib sitting is saying, Tim, it doesn't matter though. The model of watch he bought isn't suited to hard knocks. It's like being angry that your Milgauss imploded when diving because Rolex sells the deep sea and you didn't buy that. And Mark S is saying Mussolini wore Panerai. No, the, the decimal fatilia guys were like, they were the hardcore of the fascist regime. Most of the Italian military did actually defect the allied size, but a lot of those Decima X guys, they uh, they went and they worked with the Waffen SS in fortifying the Italian peninsula after Operation Torch. It was a messy business. But the bottom line is today's Panerai watch is apolitical and not suitable for droppage. Okay, bump, 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 bump. I can see Kevin Wiltshire joining us from Scotland. And I can see John H. saying combat watch equals G-Shock. Yes, that's a fact. As a former military guy, that is what SEALs will wear. That or a Timex Iron Man. Okay, moving along. Yves S. asks, Tim, do you prefer the Patek Philippe Aquanaut or the Nautilus? Okay, I feel like I get asked this question a lot too, so let me answer it more completely than in the past. I've also changed my mind, so this is not the same answer as before. Here's where we start. The Nautilus launched in 1976, the Aquanaut launched in 1997. Opposite ends of the style spectrum with the sole respect that these are steel sports watches from Patek Philippe. Now here's the thing, I prefer the spirit that is the idea of the Aquanaut, stripped down to a rubber strap, less luxury lifestyle baggage, less blinding polish to call attention, and the green one is a dream watch for me. That is special, that's really something. That's the 5167A-011. Personality wise, I'm an Aquanaut guy. Here's the problem, reality bites. And the Nautilus is just far easier to wear. Across the wrist, especially a small one like mine, I find that the Nautilus is just more comfortable in all of its variants, but especially on the bracelet. The Aquanaut is huge across the wrist because that stripped down look that you get with the integrated rubber strap comes at the expense of a ferociously and thick strap. So it's gonna fight your wrist, it flares out, it fights, it puts up a battle, more than a Panerai these days, I should add, and I don't like how it wears. It'll fit my wrist at 16 centimeters, but the Nautilus is more comfortable and more organic. Uh, I would also say the reality is that, quite frankly, the case finish of the half rubber 5167A is far less complex and rich than just the case finish, just the finish on the case portion of the Nautilus. You can see where Patek Philippe saved the money on creating the 5167 versus the 5711. So it's not like you've just swapped a strap for a bracelet. It is decontented, even though it uses the same movement. And ultimately, I have to say, my choice from among the entire lot, every Aquanaut, every Nautilus, would be the short-lived mono block case Nautilus midsize 5800. This is a watch that debuted with the 30th anniversary collection in 2006. You could buy it for one half of 2007 and one half of 2008. 
It's more highly sought than any 5711 in steel because of the original Gerald Genta patented case construction, ultra slim profile on the wrist, and the rare combination of the monoblock case and the display case back. So this is much closer to the original 3700 in its construction. And there's a reason that this once $19,000 watch back in 2008 is now a $50,000 watch selling at or even above the price of a pre-owned 5711. It just puts it all together and on the wrist, it doesn't look like a mid-sized Nautilus. It looks and fits like a Nautilus. So that would be my choice, okay. I can see right here, uh, Philip Hayden said, saying the Nautilus sits almost at the top among all the watch models, tough to pick a better option. Diego OG saying there is the green Aquanaut, mentioned and acknowledged. That's a wonderful piece. And I can see right here, we have uh, Jason saying, is there such a thing as a Patek Hulk? Yes, there were about 10 to 12 pieces of a special order green Aquanaut. You can't order the watch anymore, but you can order the green strap for your standard 5167. And then I can see right here, Kevin Wiltshire, you're saying to Anthony O, oh, I spent my first two weeks in Australia in Melbourne. He's a big fan of the Melbourne Grand Prix. Me too. I like my audience here. Okay, moving on. We have a question from Ronald C, who asks a very straightforward question about fashion and favors. Ronald C asks, hey Tim, if a fashion-driven watch brand like Ublo, and let's say it is Ublo offered to provide you with a free watch on the condition that you'd have to wear it on the air and publicly in general in your capacity with Watchbox, would you accept and if so, which model would you choose? Okay, Ronald, I'm going to disappoint a lot of people right here. First of all, it wouldn't be that model, but yes, I would accept. I would absolutely accept. And free watches are cool. I'm in favor. There are some Ublo models I like. But second, there would be a serious discussion between me and Ublo regarding two key, I would say, wedge issues. First, exclusivity. I wouldn't stop wearing my usual watches. I'm not going to change who I am because I added something to my wardrobe. The JLCs and the Omegas and the Swatches stay. Second, I would be very, very vocal to my audience about the nature of that watch and that sponsorship. I would tell you straight up, just as I tell you I'm selling everything you see on this show, that the watch on my wrist was given to me by one of our OEM partners and that I'm effectively acting in a sponsored capacity. That would never be a secret. This isn't Instagram. I've got an Instagram account, but it's not that kind of Instagram account. Um, okay, you deserve to know what you're seeing. I'm a paid spokesman for a brand right now, right here. Please don't confuse me with an actual journalist like Angus Davies, Elizabeth Dore, or Ariel Adams. Okay, that said, what would I pick? Well, I'd pick the 2006 Magbang. This was a 250-piece limited edition, mostly in magnesium with the titanium movement. It was a very special watch, and it was also one of the first watches that I reviewed here on this channel back in 2014. It left an impression, a positive impression. The 70-gram full watch mass undercuts even Zenith's $22,000 El Primero lightweight. This watch looks and feels like an occasion, not just a watch, but an occasion. And this lightweight magnesium Big Bang features a rich array of grayscale tones, textures, and a few red accents to pop to create an aesthetic that is as special as the material and the experience. For those who like movements, and you know I do, there's the HUB44, which is basically a Valsu 7750, but the bridges and plates were made out of titanium, which cut the weight of, or I should say the mass of the movement, for you engineering types, from 45 grams to 20 grams, and that's legitimately impressive. This was Hublot's first foray into in-house watchmaking. I should also mention that it's a back catalog piece from a different era, so they might have to scrounge around to find one, but I've seen Hublot special editions in their boutique in Miami from almost a decade ago. I know they could make this happen. Make mine the flammable Hublot, the magnesium model. Hopefully that's not how it ends. Okay, now if I must pick from the current catalog, then the Big Bang Mecha 10 Magic Gold. <gasps> Gold. Yes, Hublot, Big Bang, and Gold all in one. But here's the thing. This particular watch has a cool 10-day in-house caliber, the HUB 
1201 that is a beautiful twin power reserve, twin mainspring barrel, mechano styled or erector set styled piece. I adore it. I was there for its birth in 2016, so I'm partial to it. And here's the thing about Magic Gold. A, it's a scratch resistant as ceramic, and B, it looks like aged bronze. Not just bronze, but aged bronze. This is not the gold watch you choose when you want to communicate gold. Is it stupid? Yeah. But it's stupid like a dog is stupid. You, you take it in stride and you love it in spite of that. Or maybe because of it. Okay. That won't be an issue. No one's ever going to give me free stuff. Okay, I can see right here. I'm sure I've Annoyed someone. A question from I Like Watches. Tim, is anyone still making 33, 34 millimeter high horology dress watches? There are still many small Nomos watches available that are right in that size. Check out the Tetra line. I don't know if I'd call them high horology, but they're definitely luxury horology and the most logical place to start. There's also a huge back catalog of 34 millimeter Jager Lecoultre pieces. The 34 millimeter Master Ultra Thin, I recommend it with the blue dial and platinum. That is a largely hand finished ultra thin handmade movement in a high horology case and it would be the first place I stopped because I own the steel version. Okay, jumping back to our chat box, I can see right here Lionel B is asking me, Tim, oh, it's for Steve Bowden is saying, Tim at Watchbox Studios, the gold Hublot looks like it's bronze. Magic gold does. Not king gold. Magic gold. And I can see Lionel's asking, how accurate is your system frog? Cheers from Belgium. Thank you for watching me all the way from Belgium. I appreciate you staying up late to be with us. It's not that accurate. Truth be told, it loses about one to two minutes a week. Whatever number they claimed when it came out, it's not really that good. It's nice because it has long legs. It has almost four days of power reserve, so I can put it down for two, even three days, and it's still running. But it is not an accurate watch. You do trade some things for a $150 price point on a mechanical watch. But doesn't it look the business? I love this thing. Okay, and I can see right here, Bill Cosgrave is saying, titanium is a good material for watch movements because it is not that sensitive to temperature and it is flexible. True, and with low unsprung weight, it also has a reasonable degree of shock resistance. And right here, I can see, Angelo is saying the only Hublot I would wear would be the Mecca 10. You and I are of one mind, Angelo. Okay, guys, right now, I have viewer wrist shots because this is an interactive show, and I love it when you let me show your watches on my program. First and foremost, Russell K. and his Ulysse Nordin Aqua Perpetual get us started. This was a limited series with white gold bezel back in 2003. Flink K lacquer style stamped guilloche dial with a lacquer translucent coat over it and the same for the bezel bi-directional perpetual calendar and just under 43 millimeters i love that luscious blue dial win h of texas shares his wife julie's cartier ballon bleu a gift for her birthday both of you have excellent taste she wears it well kenneth m rides the rails with his ball train master chrono ball a brand we don't discuss often enough on this program i'm going to fix that in the near future and julio b rocks one of my favorite chronos of all time with his arnold and son ctb sweep seconds and deadbeat seconds at the wheel of his porsche watches and wheels my favorite combo send your wrist chats to monday mailbag at the watchbox.com okay tonight Guys, it's no secret, and I kind of let you in on the game a little earlier with the Mecha 10 in Magic Gold, that colored and gold watches are a bit controversial among hardcore watch enthusiasts. I've visited this topic in the past, and we're revisiting it tonight because there's more to say. But colored gold watches we love, part two starts right now. Okay, when I say we, I mean me. Sort of. These selections are a result of my canvassing of a broad range of collectors who generally eschew yellow and rose gold. There's no doubt that I prefer white metals. You've seen all of my watches, this one accepted. And there's abundant evidence from auctions, the primary market wait lists for Rolex and Paddock, as well as secondary market sales and markups. Suggest, and by the way, I'm looking at you, Steel BLRO. There is evidence that white metals are the first choice of watch collectors and connoisseurs at many price points. Tonight, I'd like to share a few of the colored gold watches that I love, explain why I love them, and try to build a bridge between these watches and you guys out there. It would be my pleasure to read your selections for what colored gold watches you love from the chat box during this segment. Okay. You already know that I love the anti-gold bronzed physique of the Big Bang Mecha 10, so let's move on to Audemars Piguet. Okay, 
While others like Vacheron, Rolex, and Paddock have kept the faith with fans of colored gold, especially yellow gold, no brand has made more noise about its return to yellow gold, the yellow gold fold, than AP since 2016's show of force in the Royal Oak collection. Then came 2017 and the jumbo. A gold on gold Royal Oak 15202 Extra Thin was a bit much. That's the model you see there. But the light blue dial was just right, fairy tale style. And note the attention to detail right there, as that blue is lighter by some margin than the tapisserie galvanized blue on the rose gold. So you have two galvanized blues, that one is darker than the yellow gold, and distinctly so. I should also say that complete with a classic caliber of ultra-thin proportions, this is the ultra-thin we've come to know and love since the very beginning. This is the core royal oak, and in yellow gold, for some reason, the watch that was only ever designed to be made in steel just sizzles. I love this thing. The show-stopping 2017 15202BA would be an easy choice for me, and something I would actually own myself and buy with my own money. It makes yellow gold lovable to younger tastes. Now, even if all younger buyers, and keep in mind, we're talking 30s through 50s here, not, not kids, not teens, not in their 20s, but as opposed to people retired wearing their yellow gold retirement watch, but even if all younger buyers can't swing the $55,400 retail price of this jumbo, changing perceptions is an exercise that starts early, and AP is ahead of the game with this watch. I love this piece. And I can see right here, Cull Obsidian is saying, I own a royal, I think he's saying, I own a royal oak in gold and would only ever want it in steel, but rose gold is awesome. And I can see right here, bum, 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 we have Steve Bowden saying, that is beautiful in blue, and that is a fact. It is sensational in blue. It's also available in green, but that's a show for another day. Now, do you guys like complications? Mmm, so do I. And we have one hell of a watch in store, a watch you saw earlier accidentally, so we gave up part of the game, but I would love to go for a spin with the IWC Portuguese Tourbillon Handwound F.A. Jones. Now, this was a 2010 model year series of 50 pieces and very, very special. Reference 544702. I loved the look of its 43.1 millimeter yellow gold case when I first experienced this watch years ago, so much so that I was left stunned and frankly a little bit sad when it left us. And I don't say that of many of the thousands of watches I review for the channel. After disavowing yellow gold early in my collecting career, this IWC Portuguese gave me instant second thoughts about that choice. So punchy was that metallic blue dial. The yellow gold dial furniture, including the indices, the numerals, the hands, the frame for the tourbillon, and the sub-seconds. That it throws shade on the flying tourbillon itself. Yep, you could almost forget that this is a flying tourbillon. It's there, it's present and correct, but it's not the highlight of this watch. Incredibly, the dial and the case overshadow the tourbillon. And that's what makes this one special. I cannot think of another dial side tourbillon watch whose case and dial alone draw your focus entirely away from the signature mechanism. Also right here, I can see Anthony O saying he is a big fan of the rose gold Vacheron Constantin Corn de Vache. That is a very, very good point. And I can see Alvin saying royal oak steel and blue dial is a killer. Guys, tell me which colored gold watches you love. We know steel is real. It's always the king, along with platinum and white gold. But tonight, we're indulging. Play along with me. Jumping forward playing along. The next watch is a superhero level Rolex complication, a truly special watch that caught me napping. I didn't know about this Daytona until it was practically on my wrist. It showed up on my desk the other day for review. It arrived for a video I was simply blown away. After a close encounter with this dial, bezel, and case, I decided that it was my favorite of the 2017 Basel World Rolex Precious Metal Daytona Oyster Flexes. We saw them in rose, we saw them in yellow, we saw I'm in white, and I thought I was all about the white gold until I saw this thing. Sure, white gold is offered, and that's my usual, but when yellow gold looks this good, or blanc can wait. The Cornish colored cosmograph is the sleeper sensation of the entire collection. You can write that down. I'm sticking to it. Omega. 
2018 because where there is Rolex there is Omega and Omega 2018 brought the goods and I was pleasantly surprised. This was the 25th anniversary of the original 1993 Omega Seamaster Professional Diver 300 meter and this timepiece for me was the star. You never expect a mainstream volume brand to release a tribute to an obscure and somewhat dated design from the 1990s. But here it is in Sedna, red gold, titanium, and tantalum. Tantalizing tantalum, I must say. Years ago, you might have met the original Rose Tantalum Titanium Seamaster 300 meter diver chronograph on the Watch You Want channel when we still had the Watch You Want channel. I did, and I called it an Omega that was less for James Bond 007 and more for a Bond villain like the flamboyant Emilio Largo who today is almost like a parody of himself, but I digress. Here we are, and there it is. The 2,500 pieces of this limited series will cost 13,000 each, so Omega had the nerve to price this against a Rolex Yacht Master in full gold. Now, I should also say that exquisite detail, such as the blue titanium tantalum bezel combination, and you can see that there's a titanium case and a blue bezel underneath the red gold of the insert. That blue, including the center links of the bracelet, is the tantalum. And it is distinctly different. It is the bluest metal I have ever seen. It is not gray, it is blue. But everything about this thing, such as that bezel and the bolted 18 karat rose gold serial number plate make this edition sizzle. You can practically hear it. You spit on it, it will evaporate. It is like an engine block on a hot summer day. You could fry hot dogs on this thing for Labor Day weekend. Bolder still was Omega's decision to stamp the solid titanium dial, and it is a solid Omega Wave titanium dial with no date window. Take a look, there's no date. Like a nerd at the prom, this thing is totally clean, absolutely dateless. That's another bold move. They put a big price on it. It's a reference to a weird watch that few people remember, and they went dateless on a sports watch. Nobody does that. Omega, chapeau. All right, that is not my favorite gold watch of the evening. To be fair, once upon a time, 1865 actually, Georges Favre Jaco traveled to Lelouch, Switzerland, and he founded the Zenith Manufacture. He had a wonderful mustache, and it produced a wonderful integrated watch manufacture. In 2015, Zenith paid him back with interest with the Academy Georges Favre Jaco at 45 millimeters in red, not pink, not rose, red. 5N copper intensive gold. This watch is as much a celebration of modern Zenith's abilities as a tribute to the old man. The red gold case felt appropriate to the exuberance of the occasion, and anything less would have seemed unworthy of a proper anniversary. In an industry where watch brands celebrate two, three, five year anniversaries of watches no one's ever heard of, 150 years of Zenith actually mattered, and this was the watch to do it. Now, I should also mention that the Fusée and Chain Constant Force system was a major technical highlight, and paired with a high-beat non-chronograph application of the El Primero 10 beat per second escapement, the whole thing was executed with gorgeous finish upon all of the details, so as part of the Academy line, this is the kind of finish that Zenith does not pull out too often. Beautifully executed on the dial side, you don't even have to take the watch off to appreciate that for which you've paid. 150 pieces were made, and the result was a modern high water mark for the Zenith manufacturer. This was the best of what was now in 2015, and I hate to say it, but there have been few high highs to match ever since. In many ways, Basel World 2015 and the 150th anniversary collection was the final hurrah for watches at Zenith developed under outgoing CEO jean frederic Dufour before he bolted to run Rolex. And watches like that Georges Favre Jaco are the reason he is today running Rolex. Literally and symbolically, the Georges was not a bad parting shot. And that's the parting shot of the model, a gorgeous case back. Best article of the week. By the way, guys, let me see. What have you what have you chimed in and told me you prefer? Philip Hayden, Gold Cartier Tank. I can see right here, Alvin is saying, I will go at most two-tone. Full gold is way too bling for me. Rolex two-tone GMT or a subby with blue sunburst dial. Okay, I can feel that. I can see right here. Steve Bowden is noting Georges Favre Jaco's integrated mustache and integrated curl. Diego OG is saying, for him, gold longer time longer one time zone, and he traded his rose gold date 8-2 for yellow gold date 8-40. And right here I can see 
Mark S. is asking, Tim, did you have a prom date? It was the $1,000 I pocketed instead of going. That was my date to the prom. And no regrets, no hangover, and no bad memories of the prom limo. Let's see, bump, 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 bump. And I can see Stephen Sharp is saying, I'll give you a pass on a two-tone. Uh, bump, bump, bump. True Lie saying, I know the Omega boutiques in Manhattan don't have the tritone. I figure they would be the first. It's true, that watch hasn't been delivered yet. And I can see right here Dave the Watch Guy saying, Hey Tim, considering the price as a factor, what would you rather have, a Geo Pano Inverse or an Entry Longa One? Geo Pano Inverse. Unless I could get the Longa One in steel. In 1998, they did that. All right, jumping back into our program, guys, I'm going to revisit the box. Best article of the week. SJX, the true story of the mythical Rolex Zenith Daytona in platinum. Speaking of precious metal Rolex Daytonas by SJX of watchesbysjx.com. Well, I've mentioned the 2013 to present anniversary Daytona, the first series production platinum Daytona as a special and historically significant landmark model. It was not the first platinum Daytona. Reference 16516, part of perhaps a series of half a dozen of that special designation, was built for VIPs at the behest of VIPs during the 1990s. One example, gifted personally by Rolex Director General Patrick Henniger in 1999, is going to auction this fall with a full set with all documentation proving that not only is it the real deal, but you have the entire backstory as far as Rolex is concerned. It's a sensational combination of Zenith El Primero caliber, peerless history, rarity, platinum case, and mother of pearl dial make this a career-defining score for any collector of the ultra haute de gamme and rare. If you're a Rolex collector, this is a rare non-vintage Rolex that could be the defining piece in your set. And you can buy it. You can buy this watch at Sotheby's Important Watches Auction that takes place in Hong Kong on October 2nd. The estimate is a cool 500,000 US dollars. Bump, bump, bump. And I can see right here, John H., Yacht Master in Rose Gold on Oyster Flex. And Mark S. saying, I feel bad Tim didn't have a prom date, even if he disagrees. Trust me, <laughs> I'm all good. <laughs> and I can see right here, Five-year wait list asking, are meteorite dials actually that? Yes, yes they are. But the grain you see on a meteorite dial is actually what's known as a vidman staten pattern, which actually might be a misnomer, but I digress. It's an oxidized and stabilized pattern. That's how they create that. But yes, it is absolutely meteorite. It comes from ver various places in ac in previously in Africa and now in Argentina. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me. I've got one parting shot for you who participated, viewer wrist shots. Okay, Elton H. of Dublin, Ireland puts the emeralds back in the emerald isle with his Seiko Prospects. This is an SBDC 059. He's a man after my own heart with a Benz 450 SLC and an Audi RS6 by MTM, the upscale tuner of Audi. Simon H. returns to our program en volant with his Rolex Explorer 2 Polar while flying over Napa. I can see that Gerald from Singapore takes us home with our second Rolex dual time, his GMT Master CHNR. Two times Rolex, two times owners leaves me to beat to continue. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Guys, thank you for joining me. This was an absolute ball. I enjoyed every minute of it. And XX, Space XX, Tim, do you see the Patek Philippe Neptune Salmon Dial becoming a collectible? I do. And that's all I've got for you guys. Thanks for joining me. I'm Tim. This is the Watchbox. Thanks to you. Thanks to my crew. Time out. Tim out. And thanks for logging on.